Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher X video. All right, we're back to a, I guess you would still say a new channel favorite here, Fat Electrician. And boy, is he a growing. And I've had a hard time keeping up with all his awesome content. But I want to get on track because it looks like his latest video is blowing up. It's called Angry Old Veteran versus 700 Redcoats. Samuel Whitmore. This thing's pushing 500,000 views in two days. And it doesn't surprise me because this guy is super entertaining. He was also nice enough to send me some of his merch. All right, original videos down below. Please give it a view, like, subscribe if you have not, and let's get started. All right, here we go. It's the official state hero of Massachusetts. Right. Right. State General hero Massachusetts. Samuel Whitmore, quite possibly America's first anti-hero and the most gangster old man of all time. But first, yeah. we'll for a sponsor because this video is brought to you by Operation Good Boy. They make all kinds of dog-related products from supplements to treats to toys to dog Aww. picker upper bags. Look his and dog. Mushu absolutely loves the Made in America treats ready to eat. A dog would love this stuff. Okay. Frankie over. would love this stuff. Roll over. Roll over. Come on. You got it. My dog I'll has that problem too thing. because if there's not you enough room, he won't he won't roll over. Roll over. Roll over. Roll over. You're making me look bad. So he does that too. My dog does that too. Roll He's like, over. this is all I can do with the space I'm given. Fine. Good job. <laughs> so yeah, check him out at operationgoodboy.com. Use the code QUACK15 for 15% off. Let's get back to the video. All right, Samuel Whitmore, we don't know much, but here's what we do know. He was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1696. From there, he goes dark. We don't hear from him until 1721 when he gets married to his wife, Elizabeth Spring. Then he goes dark again. There's nothing of him in the historical record until 1744. At the age of 48 years old, he would fight in King George's War. And during that war, he held the rank of captain, leading an entire platoon of dragoons during the siege of Loisburg. If you don't know, dragoon is just a fancy word for cavalry. So think of like Malfoy's dad from the Patriot. It, same thing so that's oh, how bad did we hate that so 1740s before so we're 13 colonies um before the french and indian war which really set the motion the more immediate motion to eventually um independence and the american revolution so we're still you know a good 30 plus years out so He's fighting redcoats uh, before, well before the re uh, the American Revolution. Cool, whatever, but here's the important part that nobody else ever brings up. Like I said, he's a captain, which is a way bigger deal than most people make it out to be. And here's why. There's really only two ways that you can become Especially an officer back then. in the British military at this point in time. Way number one, you were born into a wealthy British aristocratic family and daddy's got a lot of money. That's like 95% of the British officers at this point in time. Or way number two. I mean, it's honestly like still feudal, basically landowners all that stuff totally passed there's so much nepotism too and way way less likely you are a complete badass doing gangster shit on the regular <laughs> and they absolutely need you to lead some men given the fact that samuel's just some random colonial that was born in massachusetts it kind of narrows down which category he fell into so he and his men help lay badass. siege to fort lewisburg that goes well they take over the fort from there the war is over so he heads back home to what is now arlington massachusetts from there he goes back to doing seemingly the only other thing he's good at because i'm not Be kidding you, this guy does two things his entire life he plows stuff and he fights wars when he's not fighting <laughs> wars he's back at home plowing his fields and plowing his wife because this dude has <laughs> 10 kids i am not kidding oh. you there was only two things on okay. the historical record that even proved that this man existed for the next 10 years one is the sheer amount of birth certificates where he is listed as the father i mean the mother is always his wife he's not cheating on his wife it's just they're having a bunch of kids and second and my well, most favorite back. detail of this well, entire story then. when he came back from war he had a very very decorative ornate almost gaudy french officer sword covered in gold and rhinestones and jewels and all kinds of shit and it became his prized possession that he would show off to all of his buddies in town and when they would ask him where on earth he got that the only thing he would say is and i quote the previous owner died suddenly <laughs> fucking i acquired it all right so fast <laughs> that reminds me of that viking meme where it's like uh what does it say it's like vikings just happened to find all this gold in the monastery and somehow all the the priests died and stuff like that just Four happened to years. happen <laughs> plowing <laughs> plowing <laughs> 
It is now 1754 and Attila the Whitmore over here is approximately 58 years old and the French and Indian War breaks out. Now, does Sam have to go fight this war? Absolutely not. He is a 58 year old man in the 1700s when the life expectancy is 60. He should be keeling over any minute now, but he also has 10 kids. So he's literally like, um, mm -hmm. honey, I gotta go beat up the French again. Okay, bye. And another sword. <laughs> His room is sick, by the if way. If you don't know, the French and Indian War is basically the Kingdom of France versus the British Empire, okay. and both sides are backed by different Native American tribes. This is supposed to... Okay, so, um, gotta add my history, right? It's what you're here for. So, um, the... It, the French and Indian War is part of the larger Seven Years War, which in a lot of ways could almost be considered like the First World War. You had France, you had Britain, they each had allies, and they fought on multiple continents at the same time, basically for imperial dominance. Uh, Britain and France had really emerged as the two big European uh, imperial powers and were competing in North America. Uh, Crown jewel, all of it was probably India, back in Europe, all over the place. And this was just when they say French and Indian War, that's the that's the um, the the section of this of the Seven Years War that was fought over North America. Who's going to be the dominant force in North America? Possibly the war that Mel Gibson's character fought in in The Patriot, and presumably where he got his cool tomahawk from. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Did Sam Whitmore get a cool tomahawk too? No, so. no, he didn't. But what he did get was two matching dueling pistols that were super cool. And you're never going to believe this, but the previous owner died suddenly. Okay, <laughs> look, it's not stealing if they don't exist anymore. That's just the rules, I guess. So Sam and his men beat up on the French yet again. He acquires some fancy dueling pistols, and then he heads back home. Okay, fast forward so funny. again. <laughs> Still plowing. Oh my god, how it old is, now is he 1763 now? 1763 and Sam Whitmore is 67 years old and the Pontiac Rebellion breaks out. Surely he's going to sit this one out, right? Absolutely not. He grabs his French sword, he grabs his double dueling pistols, his musket, and he heads off to war yet again. So he goes, he fights in that war for a little bit, comes back home, at which point he decides that he's going to get involved in politics. So somewhere along the line, he starts rolling around in the political circles. He finds himself at a fancy dinner party, and there's this guy there that's running for House of Representatives, and his name is John Vassal, and he represents everything that Sam hates. Sam is a small town farmer that's just trying to plant his crops and bang his wife, and this guy is like the big powerful merchant out of Boston, the big city, running the ports, making all this money. He wants to get into office to make laws more beneficial to him so he can be rich and Sam is just trying to get by. So at this dinner party, Sam, who's not scared of anybody, informs him, hey, by the way, you're no better suited for office than the horse I rode in on. By the way, my horse's name is Nero. He's parked out front and he's not worth five pounds, which I'm not an expert in translating old timey colonial speak, but it sounds like he's saying you're not worth a horse's ass. Go fuck yourself. And <laughs> Hey, it's important to note that there are very much two cultures developing and have been developing in colonial America, the urban Boston elite kind of culture. These guys are the ones that run, uh, they do manufacturing, they do trade, that kind of thing. They're dealing with foreign countries. And then you have the wilderness folk <laughs> that have been trying to get away from that. And there's two very, very different cultures. And and not just North versus South, which is going to be the famous thing. Eventually you get to the Civil War, American Civil War in the next century, where it definitely shows the difference between the different cultures. But even in like the North, for example, um, in this time period, still still pretty early right 1760s um yeah you don't have to go very far outside of boston to hit that rural community that lives a very different life which point john vassal gets very upset and decides that he is going to sue sam for public defamation for the price of 1000 pounds which is That's a, a lot. shit ton of money back yeah. then. So the entire town finds out about that this lawsuit him. and they all show up to court to actually watch the trial because Sam represents that grizzled old man that's just saying what's on everybody's Is he representing mind, himself but too? But nobody else has the balls to say. And he goes in and basically turns this entire trial into the roast of John Vassal. <laughs> Ends up winning. Sam doesn't get sued. At which point, he slaps him with a counter lawsuit on the spot and ends up counter suing him for $200 and wins. So that kind of launches Sam's political career. Career. Fast okay. forward again. It's now <laughs> 1765. The British maybe. Empire has been fighting France for quite a while and it's getting expensive. They need to make more money, and the best thing they can come up with is a Stamp Act. Basically, they're going to charge the colonials a tax yeah. on every single printed piece of paper that they come up with. This is like the modern day equivalent of if every time you made a phone call, sent a text, or visited a website, you yeah. had to pay a tax for it. And people. 
people are absolutely outraged and Sam is infuriated. I mean, so they, they dropped. So the British win the war. Okay. Win that war. And at an incredible economic cost, they have to, they have to recover from this. So um, historically at this time, the, the, the British did not tax their colonies and their colonists nearly the rate that they did of actual British citizens back, back in Britain. So they started putting on these taxes, right? And they're saying, Hey, we fought on your behalf, 13 colonies. Uh, you should have to pay up and have to, uh, 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 you know, bear some of the load of that. Right. And they start dropping those. They saw a stamp bag, maybe the, probably the most hated, I would say, I, I think it's, I think you could say that there are a bunch of them though. There's sugar and tea and the town shindax, all those, a, a whole bunch of them. And this one sounded ridiculous to people, printed materials, basically any printed material, playing cards, newspapers, contracts needed this official stamp that really provided no value. It's not even like a like a notary, you know, like you might think it's like that. No, there's a way to tax it. Americans are getting upset. You all know where this leads. I mean, from his point of view, he's been fighting the French for the British Empire, and now he's going to have to pay an extra tax just for doing it. He is so mad that he ends up becoming a hardcore revolutionary. But he's also like a 70 year old he's man. Old so he's mostly crap. just serving on committees being like, hey, maybe America should be its own country. We shouldn't pay so much in taxes, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward again. And this blew the this blew the colonists or sorry Britain's mind. They're like, why are they freaking out so much about these taxes? It's such a low tax rate. They absolutely hated it. But it overall it just shows how distant distant the colonies are now from you know the British Empire. Um, in fact, I don't know if he gets to it, but uh, the British end up repealing basically all the taxes except for the tea <laughs> for, on tea, which there you're going to get the uh, Boston Tea Party a little bit later. It is now 1773. Samuel Whitmore is okay, a 75 close. year old man, and the British government has just rolled out their new and improved strategy for making even more money the Tea Act. Yeah, they're going to start taxing the importation of tea, which will go down in history as one of the greatest ideas of all time. Now, at this point, <laughs> Sam is serving on a committee representing his hometown of Cambridge, which would later become known as Arlington. And that committee sends a response to the British government in regards to the Tea Act that basically says, fine, if you're going to charge us more money, we're just not going to buy your tea. Yeah, because, and I quote, if we fail to assert our rights, we will dwindle into supineness. Now, like I said earlier, not an expert in translating old timey colonial talk, <laughs> but it sounds like Sam and his committee just told the British government that we're not going to buy your metric leaf water because we're not going to let you guys fuck us. That's why. Th so that, that was what they basically did to all those taxes, because it was like, OK, we can't fight these guys. Right. And they're going to pass these taxes. But we don't have to buy the stuff that's being taxed, right? They wanted to, to basically Americans to pay a tax on every imported good and wanted Americans to be uh, to to be taking in nothing but imported goods. So they're like, we'll just boycott it, right? Just boycott it. And that that hurts, right? How you hit how you hurt the, the, the British at this time is you hit them in the wallet. OK, you don't hit you don't hurt them on the battlefield. They're going to plow you over. Right. Um, they're the biggest most powerful military in the world. Hit them in their pockets. Then they listen or have to, at least have to listen to you. At this point, pretty much everybody in America is pissed off. They start smuggling tea to avoid taxes. Yeah. The Boston Tea Party happens December 1773. From there, people just start stockpiling guns and gunpowder and supplies, getting ready for war if one should break out. Now, fast forward April about 1775, two years. General Thomas Gage is appointed the military governor of Massachusetts, and he will be residing in Boston, which has been turned into a British military stronghold. At that point, General Gage... And also the site of the most protests um, across the country. Boston is the busiest port probably in North America, probably in the Western Hemisphere at this time. It is, is the center of everything. Hey, you know what? I'm going to get proactive. I'm going to stomp out this whole rebellion talk right here and right now. I'm going to take 700 men, an entire regiment, and I'm going to march them out to Lexington and Concord. While First battles Lexington, of the revolution. They're going to arrest those stupid, annoying revolutionaries, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, and then they're going to continue marching to Concord where they're going to burn down all the stocked up military supplies. So the British military starts making preparations for a huge movement, at which point revolutionary spies find out and they decide to let everybody know. And when I say they decide to let everybody know, I mean a silversmith from Boston by the name of Paul Revere Revere's is going to take off at midnight, ride through the entire countryside, going house to house, telling everybody that the British are coming. And guess whose house is Get the militia Boston ready. and Lexington? Sam motherfucking Whitmore. Oh, That's who. He was, I'm oh, he was on the freaking Paul Revere ride. By the way, Sam Adams, he mentioned, uh, or yeah, Sam Adams, uh, um, 
and 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 uh, Paul Revere. These guys were elites in in Bo- in Bostonian society. Like they in America, they are wealthy wealthy businessmen um, who are integral. Without I think those type of people and they're using their resources and organization and stuff like that. And the, the revolution or the, you know, Patriots, whatever you're going to call them, um, that spy network they were talking about was really, really good. Actually, it's very productive and, and, and helped a lot. I'm not shitting you. It is like 99% sure that Paul Revere showed up at 78 year old Samuel Whitmore's house <laughs> sometime in the middle of the night and was like, hey, just letting you know, the British are coming. At which point he's like, hell yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Paul Revere is like, okay, whatever. I got to go warn everybody else. And Samuel goes back to bed. That morning, April 19th, 1775, the British are marching and they're almost to Lexington and they are cut off by 77 Minutemen led by a man by the name of John Parker. John Parker orders the Minutemen to, quote, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have war, let, let it, it be begin here. here. Yeah. So the British roll up with seven. Um, British are looking for. Uh, weapons, stockpiles of ammunition and stuff like that because of the threat of war. And that's essentially what they're looking for here um, at Lexington and then a Concord. 700 trained professional soldiers and tell these 77 Minutemen, literally farmers that just picked up whatever guns they had around and told them, disperse you rebel scum. At which point the Minutemen are like, Nah, we're good. We're going to stay right here, and so are you. And that's exactly what happens. They just stand there staring at each other from across this field with the British officer not knowing what to do because he has to get to Concord. Shot heard around the world's coming up. Because those were his orders, but he also doesn't want to open fire on these guys because that will mean the start of the Revolutionary War. So they just stood Yeah, neither side wants to appear like the bad guys, right? That's what they've been trying to do. Public image is so big right now for, for both sides or seemingly forever in formation ready to throw down waiting for the other guy to make the first move and suddenly from the american side a gun goes off nobody knows who fired nobody knows why but this was the shot heard around the world that would start the american revolution and for all we know it could have been some old farmer that just dropped his gun (laughs) the old guy lord of the rings From there, all hell breaks loose. Both sides fire on each other. Eight American Minutemen are killed, and the British to advance retreat. towards Concord. The surviving retreat. Minutemen take off to go tell everybody that the Revolutionary War has officially begun, as the British spend the next four hours searching through Concord, gathering all the military supplies and lighting them on fire. Everybody in the surrounding area sees all the smoke from the burning supplies, and they think that the British military is burning down the entire town of Concord. Because of that, 2,000 Minutemen show up to fight back, at which point the British are like oh shit and they start retreating they run across the bridge and start ripping the planks off of it as they go at which point the 2000 minute men and 700 british soldiers fire upon one another from either side of this bridge as the british continue to retreat the british now have to march 18 miles back to their military stronghold in boston in their stupid high-vis red coats and every single american with a gun between there and boston guerrilla warfare taking pop shots at them from the wood line yeah they're they're like in trees they're in bushes they just they're killing them while killing them while they retreat back there. This is guerrilla warfare. I mean, that's how the Revolutionary War was. This is the only way you can fight the British. You can't you can't do toe to toe, right? There's a reason why they can be successful wearing big bright red coats because the guerrilla warfare uh, is going to be successful at that. Plus, the Americans would do the in dishonorable things like shoot the uh, the officers that are on their horses and stuff like that. Stuff that seemed improper in those days but man guerrilla warfare basically has no rules (laughs) during this retreat 26 redcoats go missing 175 are wounded and 73 are killed and three of them at least are from samuel whitmore so we got (laughs) samuel whitmore he's 78 years old chilling at home presumably plowing three guys we don't really know and he just hears gunfire what was that he he did a little thing home presumably plowing something what we don't really or who (laughs) did you see that a little flashed up said who positive gunfire going off in the background and it's getting closer and closer and then he remembers oh that fucking kid woke me up last night (laughs) in midnight told me the british were coming maybe that's what's going on so he goes he grabs his fancy french officer sword both of his dueling pistols and his musket and he goes out to the main road that the british would be marching past and he's going to stand by the stone wall next to the main road and just wait for the fight to come to him like the complete badass that he is at this point all the younger minute men are running up to check on this old man like hey 
what what are you doing you shouldn't be out here and if you are going to try to do this kind of stuff at least go out in the wood line or in like a second story window to hide yourself like the rest of us so you don't get yourself killed to which samuel whitmore responds and i quote if i can only be the instrument for killing one of my country's foes i shall die in peace which i think we can all agree is gangster as fuck at this point this man is literally the living embodiment of old man strength he's just that old grizzled veteran viking that's got one more fight left in him and wants to die in battle so he can go to valhalla so he stays <laughs> yeah. there he loads his musket he loads his pistols and he waits and he waits and finally the british come marching right down the road dead at him as they get close he crouches down behind the stone wall with his musket and waits until they get to point blank range and that's when he pops up over the wall aims his gun i said get off my lawn <laughs> and fires immediately Trino, killing such a good one movie. red coat on the spot drawing both of his pistols killing two more red coats drawing his sword and charging into over 500 soldiers <laughs> on his own. He is then immediately shot in the face. Yeah. He falls to the ground and is somehow still alive. So he reaches to grab one. Of I got to process for a second here. I'm just imagining this whole giant group, 500 freaking soldiers, pops out point blank, blasts some guy, and then <laughs> charges with the sword. It just, the poor guy gets face blown off, I guess. One of his guns and start reloading it at ground and is somehow still alive. So he reaches oh, and immediately shot in the face. He falls to the ground and is somehow still alive. So he reaches to grab one of his guns and start reloading it. At which point the British run up and stab him with bayonets somewhere between six and 13 times. Apparently after the first five, they all kind of blend together. He is then <laughs> clubbed in the head with the butt of a rifle and left for dead as his body lays there. He doesn't survive, mangled right? and lifeless as the he British continue survive. to march through the town on their way to Boston. Four hours later, the townspeople notice that his corpse starts moving. So they pick Samuel up, they get him over to the doctor, they alert the family, the family shows up to the doctor, at which point the local town doctor, Nathaniel Tufts, is like, the dude is 78 years old. He wasn't prepared to handle a fall down the stairs, let alone getting stabbed 13 times shot and shot in the head. <laughs> okay, like there's no way this old man's gonna make it. But like I said, his family members start showing up and guess how many direct descendants Samuel Whitmore has at this point in time after all that plowing. Go ahead. Okay, so he had 10 kids. Let's say they all got married. They're probably all adults now. Average three, four, four kids a piece and 40. I'm going to say it's, it's, oh, it's over 50. Go ahead, give it a guess. Say it in your head. Okay. You got your number. Okay. He's got 185 living descendants. Okay. He's got five generations beneath him. He's got oh, kids, okay. grandkids, great grandkids. I didn't know that part. Grandkids <laughs> squared and great grandkids <laughs> cubed. I was just thinking grandkids. Five people showing up to the doctor, like, Hey, save grandpa. At this point, poor Dr. Tufts is like, I, pff, dude's going to die, but I'm not about to tell 180 grandkids that. So I'll try my best. So he does what he can. He bandages him up and sends him home with his family and they take care of him for the remainder of his days. And when I say the remainder of his days, what I mean is, let me check my notes real quick. Uh, I mean that he passed on February 3rd. 1793 this motherfucker lived for 18 more years and passed away at the age of 96 and to commemorate <laughs> samuel whitmore there's actually a monument where he made his last stand but wait 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 what, hold on, what is that what is what is this what is samuel whitmore there's actually a monument then 80 near the spot samuel whitmore then 80 years old killed three british soldiers april 1775 he was shot bayoneted beaten and left for dead but recovered and lived to be 98 years. How did he survive? They got shot in the face. Because, okay, in those days, when you got a wound like that, they're fatal. They got infected, right? It's before, like, our modern antibiotics and stuff like that. You you died from your wounds. You just, you died. And he got, what, how many times did they say he got stabbed? After, more than six, right? Up to, like, 13 or something. All of that bleeding. What is this guy made of? And where he made his Just last stand. Iron? Bah! You said that he was 78 during his last stand and 96 when he died. And that clearly says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Why are you so dumb? Bah! Okay, Whatever. look, I understand your point. And I also can kind of sort of read. And I realize the irony because this is literally written in stone. And I'm telling you that it's wrong, but it is wrong. That is the only source that says that he was 98 when he it died matter. and 80 during his last doesn't stand. Doesn't matter. Every other source 
source says that he was 78 and 96. This has been proven to be false multiple times, but they don't want to change it because the monument's already so old. So yes, I'm sticking with what I said. But the most important part of this picture is to actually zoom in on the house in the background. That's Samuel Whitmore's original house where he lived his entire life. Love and those it's houses. still around today as a historical site in Arlington, Massachusetts. And that monument is in the front yard. So if Dude, I love the colonial like houses like that. Those are so cool looking. That that's considered, by the way, a mansion basically in those days. Historical site in Arlington, Massachusetts, and that monument is in the front yard. So if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, what I'm trying to tell you is, in conclusion, this has been the story of America's first and oldest gangster, a 78-year-old grizzled wow. veteran that woke up on the first day story. of the American Revolutionary War and decided to casually go 3-0 and while telling the entire British Empire to get off his lawn. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang. Oh, those are sick. Those are sick. Oh, final thoughts. What a story. That was nuts. I had no idea who this guy was. Holy crap. Some people are just built different. Just like, like actually built different. I don't have anything else to say for it. <laughs> Anyways, what a great story. Um, and, and fat electrician just does such a good job at, at telling that story and making it interesting. I love these, these stories he's been telling. So this has been a lot of fun. Hopefully you learned, I was able to inj interject some things, trying to get the big picture of what's going on there. Hopefully you had fun with me along the way. If you want to check out some more of my commentary in his videos, got a few videos. I'll link them up as we're wrapping up right now. And with that, y'all, we'll see you next time. Bye.